Hello everyone and welcome to a video that's a little bit different to usual, but it's one that I've been planning to do for a little while now. If you've been following my channel for some time, you will know that I've briefly mentioned Doctor Who here and there, but never fully dedicated a full-on video to just talking about how much I love the show. I reviewed series 11 and 12 when they first aired, and I did briefly mention Doctor Who when I did my video on my favourite TV shows of all time. But for quite a while now, I've been wanting to just dedicate one video just talking about how much I love the show, and what better place to do that than talking about my top 13 episodes of the show's current run. I feel like Doctor Who in some shape or form has always been a part of my life. I've been watching the show since it was brought back in 2005, so in that sense it it already made up a vast majority of my childhood, as I watched it religiously during the Russell T Davis era, which was from Christopher Eccleston all the way to the end of David Tennant's run. And I watched it religiously back then, and even though I do still watch it now, and I do unfortunately think the show has dipped a little bit in quality in more recent years, I still persist, and I still watch the show you know, on and off, and I do think it does have its moments now and then. But, yeah, I, I, I still love this show, regardless of how good or bad it ends up being. And I think that is mainly down to the fact that this show, despite how odd its initial premise may be, and how weird some of the episodes may look, the show, believe it or not, has a very wide mass appeal to it. Because the show tackles so many different things in so many different ways, there isn't really a key thing you can really pinpoint down as to why so many people love the show. If you talk to any fan of Doctor Who, you're probably going to get a different answer as to why they love the show. For example, I love the show purely for its characters and creativity, whereas someone else might say something different. The reasons I love Doctor Who are it creates a world where you can get lost in and escape in. It also creates that fear element without heavy use of CGI, uh, for example the Weeping Angels, and it brings people of all ages together. The main reason why I absolutely love Doctor Who and why it's one of my two favourite TV shows of all time is that it's just relentlessly and unapologetically entertaining. It is so much fun to watch. It has the same campy fun entertainment value as something like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. It's very light-hearted and for the most part it doesn't take itself too seriously. Yes, it does get a little bit darker in the Matt Smith and Peter Capaldi era, but for the most part it's just a very entertaining show. Whoa! Hey there Doctor Who fans, so I'm going to keep this quick and brief, okay? So, because obviously I could talk for ages as to why I love Doctor Who so much. Um, basically, one of the reasons why I really like Doctor Who, and I think why a lot of people genuinely love this show, is it's just so accessible, you know? There's a lot of TV shows now where, you know, like Game of Thrones or Walking Dead, where they're one set genre, you know? They're one, like, you know, if you like your fantasy, that's your show. If you like your sci-fi and that, that's your show. But with Doctor Who, I feel like it's a blend of different genres like one week it could be like pure sci-fi like outer space adventure like another planet another episode could be a period piece like they're in Victorian London for example but yeah but no but that's one of the things I think is uh great about Doctor Who is it's accessible for everyone. It's not a show that's bogged down with one set genre. It's like one week you could be on a pirate ship, you know, like there was that one episode with Amy Pond and the 11th Doctor and all that. You know, you could have a episode like that where they're on a pirate ship or and then the next week they might be in a cave with robots or something. You know, it's just, it's one of those shows where your imagination can literally run wild. Why do I love Doctor Who? I love Doctor Who because it is just a classic. Like my parents grew up watching it and then I've grown up watching it. It is something that's been passed down through generations and it is just so good. Everything in it is just amazing. What is it I love about Doctor Who? Well, th there's just such an enormous canon of content to explore, sort of whether you're interested in the classic serials or you know, the expanded uh, Virgin New Adventures novels, or even the revival when Russell T. Davis and Stephen Moffat was the showrunner. You know, a program that's 
got that much longevity, you know, there's just all sorts of stories and content to explore out there, so I guess as a Doctor Who fan you're kind of discovering something new about the mythos or about the content every single time you dip into it, you know. I mean, <laughs> am I obsessed with Doctor Who? No, no, no. Absolutely no way. No. What I love about Doctor Who, more than anything, is the endless possibility of it. It speaks to the seven-year-old in me, that it is ultimately about someone with a magic box that takes them anywhere in time and space. That means the show can go anywhere and do anything. Not just any location, not just any time, any tone, any type of story. The possibilities are limitless. And that openness, that freedom, that ability to do so many vastly different things, that is the heart of what I love about this show. As you can see, there are so many different reasons as to why people love the show so much, and you can't always necessarily pinpoint it on one specific thing as to what makes the show work as well as it does. Now before I get into my favourite episodes of Doctor Who, there are a few things I want to clarify just before I get into that. Uh, the first thing is that, of course, I'm only talking about new Who. I'm not talking about the classic era Doctor Who. Um, as one, I haven't watched that much classic era Doctor Who, which I know sounds blasphemous, uh, but it's something I am looking to rectify very soon. Um, but yeah, I'm only talking about new Who. So anything from Christopher Eccleston to Jodie Whittaker is in the running. Secondly is that I've chosen 13 episodes instead of 10 because there are 13 Doctors. That should be pretty self-explanatory for most people who watch the show. Um, but I thought I'd just clarify for those of you that maybe haven't got into Doctor Who yet, I'm doing 13 episodes because there are 13 Doctors. That is the main reason why. Um, Thirdly, I am counting two parters as one whole story, even if part one might be better than part two or vice versa, I am counting the story as a whole rather than just part one and or part two. I am counting part one and two as one whole story. The next thing is that I've tried to be as varied as I can when it comes to picking and choosing episodes from different doctors. Um, you may end up seeing a little bit more of a bias towards David Tennant's Doctor because he is my favourite Doctor, he's the Doctor I grew up the most with, and I have more of a personal attachment to a lot of his episodes than I do any other Doctor. So don't be surprised if there are more of his episodes than any other Doctor. Um, but that being said, I have tried to make this list as varied as I can when choosing from different Doctors. And last and not least, there are of course honourable mentions. Even though the list is 13 episodes long, there are still a ton of episodes that are absolutely brilliant that I unfortunately couldn't include on this list. So without any further ado, these are my honourable mentions. Cue the music. So without any further ado, let's get right into the list with number 13, which for me is World Enough in Time and The Doctor Falls. Now even though I did just say that the more recent series of Doctor Who have kind of declined in quality, season 10 was surprisingly really good all around. Even though it had a few iffy episodes, overall it was surprisingly decent. And it ended up having a two-part finale that ended up being really, really great. And that, of course, is World Enough in Time and The Doctor Falls. I wasn't initially that interested with Peter Capaldi's Doctor, and the more I look back on it now, I realise that he was actually a really, really good Doctor. He was just let down by some kind really poor writing. Um, but this final two-parter for series 10, which I do think really should have been his last two episodes, are jam is just jam-packed full of brilliant moments and has a good sense of tension, but also a good sense of scale as well. This is the first time as well that I genuinely think the Cybermen are 
not just threatening, but also very sadistic in their methods. The rise of the Cybermen two-parter in Series 2 I thought was a good reintroduction of the villain, um, and I thought it worked for the sake of that story, but I never truly felt how unsettling and sadistic and terrifying they really could be until this two-part came along. And number 12 is, in my opinion, one of the most underrated episodes of New Who, uh, and it's Flatline. Now, this came at a time when I was starting to lose a little bit of interest with the show because, I'm going to be honest, Clara is not my favourite companion ever. Uh, and the more they did with her character, the less interested I got. But that being said, in her last series, they did bring out some pretty damn good episodes. And Flatline is one of them. It's one of those episodes that just works off of a simple yet initially perplexing premise that just kind of takes that premise and runs with it. And I love almost everything about this episode. From the, just the idea of the multi-dimensional uh, aliens that can kind of kill people just from a change in perspective, to the, the TARDIS, which is now fucking bite-sized. I love all the ideas that this episode has to offer, and I think it executes most of them pretty well. At number 11 is Amy's Choice. This is an episode from series 5 that I also feel kind of goes a bit un overlooked. Um, but that being said, whenever you hear people talking about this episode, it is genuinely positive, and there is every reason for that to be the case, because this episode, similar to Flatline, also takes a initially pretty straightforward but effective premise and kind of pushes it to its extremes without going too far. It's quite simple. Basically, this guy called the Dream Lord has the, uh, the Doctor, Rory and Amy trapped in a dream state where they have to choose between two different dreams they are all stuck in. One of them is real, one of them is fake. If they die in the real one, then they never wake up at all, but if they die in the fake one, they get to come back to the real world. And there is this constant sense of paranoia in the episode that just builds and builds and builds, and you really do feel for the characters and the choices they have to make. And it, it really does, for such a self-contained episode, it does make you feel a genuine sense of, you know, worry and panic as to whether these characters are genuinely going to make it out alive or not. I mean, obviously they are, but for a standalone episode to do that halfway through the series and actually make you feel some worry for these characters is pretty damn effective, because usually you won't really feel that until the two part, like, the, you know, the finale of a series, because that is when you know something could possibly go wrong and one of the characters could go. But with Amy's choice, for a singular episode to make me feel that way about the characters, whether they are going to make it out or not, it's genuinely pretty damn effective. And everything else about this episode just works brilliantly. Uh, Toby Jones as the Dream Lord is brilliant. He's creepy and a little unnerving, um, but it works for the sake of the story. Um, and yeah, this is just a brilliant episode that I highly recommend you watch. At number 10 is The Empty Child and The Doctor Dances. Now, I'm just going to get the obvious things out of the way. Uh, the introduction of Captain Jack Harkness is brilliant, and I'm glad that he stayed for longer than just this one series, because he ended up being one of the best characters in all of the show's recent run. Um, he's one of my favourite characters anyway, and the way he's introduced in this two-parter is fantastic, and he instantly leaves a mark with you, uh, which in a, in a really, really good way. Uh, the Empty Child itself is very creepy, though I don't find it as terrifying as I did when I first watched this back in 2005, when I was a little kid. Back then, I thought this thing was the scariest thing like I'd ever seen. But watching it again now, it is still very creepy and it works for the sake of the episode and there are genuinely some unsettling moments with this 
character. Christopher Eccleston really shines in a few specific moments uh, in this two-parter. The triangle, you know, the, 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 the chemistry between the three main characters, Jack, Rose, and the Doctor, is something that works really well here, but will later grow on throughout the series, or like the back end of the series anyway. And yeah, it's just a brilliant two-parter with a story that has a very good start, middle, and end, and has a uh, twist ending that works really well in the context of the episode and makes you think about other things that you saw throughout that two-parter in a different context, specifically uh, the character of Nancy. And number nine is Blink. I genuinely don't know what to say about this episode that hasn't already been said, uh, so I'll keep this one as brief as I can. The Weeping Angels are very scary, and the execution in this episode of that villain is probably the most effective in the entire show's run, because if you do watch Doctor Who, you will know that when Stephen Moffat became the showrunner, he decided to bring back the Weeping Angels on a couple of more occasions, but unfortunately, every time they were brought back after Blink, the effectiveness of how uh, terrifying they were kind of wore off with each subsequent, uh, you know, viewing of them. In Blink, they work for the sake of this self-contained story because right from the word go, you don't know what's going on and you're trying to piece the things together as to what these creatures actually are and how they work. And then in the other episodes where they're brought back, you already know how they work, so the mystery and scariness of those villains isn't as palpable as it is in Blink. At number eight is the 11th hour. Now, I'm just gonna say something. Even though David Tennant is my favorite doctor, and even still to this day, I have kind of mixed feelings about Matt Smith's Doctor. I do like his portrayal of the Doctor, but there are certain things that his Doctor does that I do have mixed feelings about. Even though, putting all that aside, I personally think, and I will stand by this till the day I die, is that Matt Smith had the best first episode for a Doctor in the show's recent run compared to any of the other Doctors. That's a bold statement. Rose is a good introduction for the episode, but you don't properly get an understanding of how Eccleston's Doctor works until the subsequent episodes afterwards. The Christmas Invasion is a good one, but you don't really get to see David Tennant's Doctor at work until the very end of the episode. Uh, Deep Breath is fine, but a bit forgettable, and The Woman Who Fell to Earth is also fine, but a bit forgettable. The 11th Hour is one of the only introductory episodes to a new Doctor that I genuinely keep coming back to time and time again. It's very well written, the performances are all, you know, brilliant and work for the sake of the episode. The story that the episode has is probably one of the better ones you could have in a post-regeneration story. And Matt Smith comes out of the doors swinging in this episode uh, because he, he, from the moment he's on screen to the very end of the episode, he, he, he really does give it his all. And even though he's got a very tough act to follow, you know, coming straight off the back of David Tennant's run, I think he does a pretty good job in making a convincing first impression. And number seven is Human Nature and the Family of Blood. Now, similar to Blink and The Empty Child two-parter, this story is beloved by a lot of people, uh, which is why I can't really bring anything new to the table in terms of praising it, uh, because I'll just be repeating what a lot of other people have said. But I don't care, because every what everyone loves about this episode is true. The concept of the Doctor transitioning into a human to hide from this deadly family who will stop at nothing to kill him is, again, another premise that is incredibly simple in idea and is executed probably as well as it could do, could have been, 
in this two-parter. David Tennant is brilliant as John Smith, not the Doctor. Freema Adjaman is truly brilliant as Martha in this two-parter. This is one of those stories where I feel like Martha truly shines because she has a lot of work to do on her own here. She doesn't have the Doctor to back her up in this situation, so she's just having to do a lot of the work on her own. So you really do feel for her in that sense. And the family of blood themselves are genuinely terrifying. Well, not terrifying, more just creepy, especially son of mine. That kid is just so... Oh, he... The way he delivers his lines is so... There's something not quite right about it. He he will, like, pause in the places in sentences where you're not supposed to put a pause. He'll raise his voice when you're not supposed to raise your voice. And, of course, you've got that iconic inhale of air through the nose. You know, the sharp inhale of air that just makes... Oh, it, it just gives me... Sh brings shivers down my spine every time I think of it. And... <laughs> I'm not a member of the family of blood, I just have a runny nose. Or am I? No, I'm pretty sure I'm not. Or am I? No, I'm pretty sure I'm not. <laughs> or am I? At number six is Vincent and the Doctor. Similar to Amy's Choice, this is another singular episode that manages to do what a finale two-parter can do, but just in a self-contained story. Now usually, if Doctor Who ever makes me feel emotional and makes me start to cry, it usually comes at a end two-part finale of a series. But the Vincent and the Doctor episode is one of the only singular episodes that makes me feel just as emotional. Purely because of how well it's acted and also how well it's written by Richard Curtis, who most of you will probably know as writing Love Actually, Notting Hill, Four Weddings and a Funeral, um, and Mr. Bean and Blackadder. Th this episode does something that usually kind of feels a little lacklustre whenever Doctor Who does. You know, whenever the Doctor and his companions go to a historical place and bump into a historical figure, and it suddenly becomes the focus of the episode. Usually those types of episodes can come off as a bit gimmicky, and aren't always the most interesting episodes in that series. But, the Vincent, but with Vincent and the Doctor, it stands out for a few different reasons. You're looking at a, a historical figure that was not famous in his own time, and was instead famous, you know, long after he died. Um, you're also looking at someone that was hated by almost everyone around him, and everyone thought he was nuts. Um, and this episode does a good job of really making you feel for the character of Vincent. And that's one thing I do love about this episode, the relationship that forms between the Doctor, Amy, and Vincent throughout this episode is truly something special. And again, the fact that they can make this friendship between the three of them so convincing in just a short, singular episode, a short space of time, is pretty remarkable. At number five is Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. Now, I'm going to be honest, I had a bit of trouble trying to choose fifth place because it was either a toss-up between this or the series four finale, The Stolen Earth and Journey's End. I genuinely didn't know which one to choose, but in the end I went for Army of Ghosts and Doomsday, even though I love The Stolen Earth two-parter for its own reasons, and I just adore that uh, finale. Um, but I ended up going for this one purely because... It was one of the first times the show felt like there was legitimate consequence. Like, yeah, there were things in series one and the rest of series two that kind of dealt with the Doctor and Rose doing, you know, going on adventures where there was uh, some form of, like, a little, you know, a little bit of consequence after their actions. But this was the first one where I was like, shit one of these characters could actually go. Even the setup for this episode is brilliant. You have Cybermen and Daleks fighting each other 
and the Doctor and everyone else is just kind of stuck in the middle of it. Um, and I, I know that might sound very fan service -y, um, but the way it's executed in this episode and the way certain things and characters were subtly, you know, built up on earlier in that series just make this two-part finale a very satisfying payoff for what was a pretty de decent series of Doctor Who. Um, but yeah, everything just works about this two-parter. The Daleks fighting the Cybermen is... Brilliant to see on screen for once, um, but is also quite funny, especially when the Daleks and Cybermen are just kind of taunting each other and don't take each other seriously. That whole aspect is funny. Daleks be warned. You have declared war upon the Cybermen. This is not war. This is pest control. We have five million Cybermen. How many are you? Four? You would destroy the Cybermen with four Daleks. We would destroy the Cybermen with one Dalek. And number four is Dalek from series one. I'm just going to say it. This is the single best introduction of a classic Who villain in all of the show's recent run. Like, they've brought the Daleks back on multiple occasions since this episode, but I don't think the Daleks as a whole, have felt more intimidating as they do in this episode. And the fact that it is just one Dalek, not a whole army of them, just kind of shows how fierce and menacing these creatures can be. What Christopher Eccleston brings out in this episode is truly fantastic, and I t personally think this is him at his best in this episode. Like, what he does with his performance in this uh, episode is truly fantastic. And yeah, you can tell there's a sense of terror in his face in certain scenes, but there is also a sense of anger as well. And he manages to play off of those two emotions very well throughout this episode. And also, the reintroduction of the Dalek in this episode is, again, it's, it's brilliant. Um, from the way, from the different ways in which the humans keep thinking they've one-upped the Dalek, and then the Dalek just kind of goes, nah, I can do this, and that kind of screws you over. There are multiple ways in the episode that that whole kind of thing happens, and I, I love it when that happens. And even though you don't want the Dalek to win, it is quite fascinating seeing the different ways in how this Dalek can just, you know, get around a thing. But number three is Silence in the Library and the Forest of the Dead. Again, another story that I can't really bring too much more new to the table uh, because it's been praised to death. Uh, but for good reason. This is a brilliant story that is executed in the best possible way. Everything is on top form in this two-parter. It's kind of terrifying, especially with the introduction of the Vashta Narada. Just the concept of them alone makes, <laughs> makes you more afraid of the dark than you maybe initially were. Um, River Song is a very interesting character, um, and the whole of her character arc, not just in this episode, but where you, uh, when you realise where her character goes and where she's been, uh, in the Matt Smith era, um, just makes this two-parter just a little bit more tragic in that sense. Um... Yeah, I don't know what else to say about the silence in the library. It's a brilliant story that, again, similar to Blink, shows off Stephen Moffat's complex writing methods in a way that doesn't overcomplicate things, but is just the right amount of complex to to get the story across in a very satisfying way. At number two is The Day of the Doctor, and for a short period of time, this was my favourite episode of New Who. But then I rewatched a certain episode and that overtook it, but I'll get onto that in a minute. Uh, but yeah, The Day of the Doctor is the 50th anniversary special episode. I think it's fe yeah, feature length 
episode of Doctor Who featuring the 11th and 10th Doctor, as well as the War Doctor, brilliantly played by John Hurt. Rest in peace. Um, and yeah, this 50th anniversary special is everything you could ask for as a Doctor Who fan. It celebrates the entire run of the show in a way that doesn't feel that fan service but also respects the legacy that the show has set up beforehand, but also makes it work in the context of the Doctors that are in this story. Matt Smith and David Tennant play off each other brilliantly in this to, uh, in this episode. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, th th this episode just felt like an event when it aired, and even watching it again now still feels like a little bit of an event, even though the 50th anniversary has passed and we're getting a bit closer to, I think, the 60th anniversary. It still feels like an event that I can happily go back and, back and watch time and time again and still feel that sense of, you know, grandeur and, you know, that epic sense of, like, this is a celebration of not just New Who, but just Doctor Who in general. Unfortunately, though, this is not my number one favourite episode anymore. My number one favourite episode of Doctor Who is, in fact, Midnight. This episode is Russell T. Davis's writing on an entirely different level. Like, I admired his writing, f like, from the moment the show came back. I was really enjoying what he was doing. But Midnight just shows a completely different side to his writing that I hadn't really seen up to that point. This is one of the few standalone episodes that I will constantly keep coming back to time and time again and never get bored with it. Everything about this episode works so well. You have a contained setting of just this, you know, holiday tour bus on a planet made of diamond, I think? Yeah, I think it's diamond. Shine bright like a diamond. Or like, you know, some you basically you can't go out onto the surface of this planet because otherwise you'd die. And just the whole setup of this story and then the initial execution of how the story plays out is really, really well done. And the midnight creature itself, the fact that you have no idea what it is to its full extent, and the Doctor doesn't even know what it is either, just makes it so much more scary, especially when things start going wrong and it starts taking over different people in the bus. And the way also this creature uses the Tenth Doctor's best weapon, which is his voice and talking a lot, the fact that it uses that weapon against him just kind of shows you that maybe this, maybe the Tenth Doctor can't talk his way out of every situation. Maybe this is one situation where that has actually kind of put him in a bit of a hole and he can't get out of it. So guys, those were my 13 favourite episodes of Doctor Who. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd love to know what some of your favourite episodes are in the comments below, so please do tell me what some of your episodes are and I'd love to just talk about Doctor Who in the comments. I also want to give a shout out to the people that were featured in the start of this video. Um, it was a last minute idea to do something like that and I'm glad that it turned out as well as it did and I'm grateful for all of them being involved. They didn't have to, but they did. Um, and yeah, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of those that were involved. Uh, Corey's Reviews, Megan from Megspace, uh, Hugh, Bethany, uh, Ben of course, and last but not least, Council of Geeks. If you enjoyed the video, then give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Bye!